going to 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. And this is where we have been. And I want to bring back in folk, into focus where we left off last time. And I want to use that as a launching pad for where we're headed. And we're not changing directions. We're just going a little farther in the direction that we're already heading. Can the church say amen? amen. And so 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, verse number 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Turn me down these monitors a little bit. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Somebody say from that day forward. You may be seated in the presence of our life changing king. And what's his name? His name is Jesus. And so we have been talking about the spirit of the Lord, the anointing, how that the anointing makes a difference. We've been dealing with specifically anointed for forward kingdom advancement. And in our text this evening, we find that David is anointed, that Samuel takes a horn of oil. And he anoints David and the spirit of the Lord came upon David. The scripture says in verse number 18 that David's resume is given. And it says that many things. It says that he was skillful with playing the heart, that he was fearless, that he was brave. He was a courageous warrior. He was wise in his decision making and that he was good looking. And then the greatest asset that he had, the Bible said, the Lord is with him. David was anointed. Somebody say David was anointed. David was anointed to rebuke evil spirits through the playing of his harp. And David was anointed as a giant killer. David was anointed. He excelled in war. David had a drawing anointing to where men drew to him in the cave of Adullam and all those that were in debt and in distress and discontent gathered themselves unto David and the Bible says that he transformed them, that they became mighty men of valor. They became warriors like David was. Because of the anointing, the, no the anointing has transformative power. How many know it's the anointing that makes the difference in our lives? It is the yoke destroying, burden removing, power of God. And we need the anointing in this season, in this day. How many know the devils don't um, uh, uh, tremble at your name? How many know it's the name of Jesus? And we when we declare the name of Jesus and we declare the name of Jesus with the anointing of God, how many know that demons tremble? The Bible declares that the anointing, it makes the difference. Look at Isaiah, the 10th chapter, verse number 27. It says this, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Because what? It tells us the purpose of the anointing. It is to destroy yokes. And a yoke is a negative thing that we are hitched up to. Therefore, it's an unhealthy thing that's linked to us that keeps us oppressed. It could be something that hurt you, something that violated you. It could be a soul tie. It could be a habit. It could be a sickness. It could be poverty. It could be a mindset. It could be a memory. It is a yoke. And the Bible declares that the anointing destroys the yoke. And how many want that, uh, that yoke to be destroyed in your life? I want to let you know that we may have had some yokes on our lives in the year 2022, but in the year 2023, we are not tolerating those yokes and we don't just want them broken. We want these yokes destroyed. 
We don't want any evidence that the yoke even existed. We want it ground to powder. We don't want it to even have a name anymore in our lives. We don't want it recognizable in our lives. We want the anointing to destroy the yoke and destroy it forever that we never go through that cycle of oppression again. Somebody say the anointing makes the difference. You know, the reason we keep sharing on this message on the anointing, keep telling you that the anointing comes to destroy the yoke. The reason why we keep sharing it, because the Bible says this in Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verse 29. It says, is not my word like as a fire? So we know the word is a fire. It purifies and it burns away all that is excess, that which has no value. The anointing comes to do that. The word comes to do that but then I like what it says in the second part and like a hammer somebody say like a hammer the word is like a hammer and so the scripture brings imagery that the word is like a hammer and you know the word is like a hammer meaning the word comes and when it comes it drops and it breaks some things that have been built up in your life the word comes and every time the word is spoken it hits like a hammer every time the word is spoken it comes like a hammer and it starts to break that hard thing that thing that's in your life that's built up that thing in your life that has established itself the word comes like a hammer and it breaks the rock that thing that's in your life it begins to break it into pieces how many need it to be broken into pieces and so the word is coming and every time you hear it here there goes another piece every time you hear the word maybe the first time you hear the word maybe there's resistance to it but every time you hear the word the anointing comes on God's word and it starts to break and destroy that thing that will that it would have no place in your life again somebody say it needs to be destroyed you may be seated So the anointing, the purpose of the anointing is to destroy yokes. The Bible also says that the purpose of the anointing is to equip you for ministry. In Luke, the fourth chapter, verse number 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? This is the purpose of the anointing, to preach the gospel, to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me, what? The anointing to announce release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as deliver those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, who are bruised, who are crushed, who are broken down by calamity the anointing comes and it equips us for ministry somebody said the anointing destroys the yoke somebody said the anointing equips us for ministry so we understand that we're in the New Testament. We talked about last time how the anointing oil, it was used. It was used as a, a, a thing to anoint people. It was a composition of different spices and it came together and they anointed different people for different things. It was applied to holy men. It was applied to holy things. That was one of the uses of the anointing oil in the Old Testament. The Bible says also the anointing came upon different ones and they began began to do exploits in the name of the Lord and so the anointing would rest upon certain individuals and they had the power to do certain things exploits for the name of the Lord but we understand that the Bible says that in the New Testament that the anointing the Holy Spirit it would just not come upon us but the Bible declares that the Holy Spirit shall be in us and that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Bible declares that the anointing, the anointing, the Holy One, Jesus himself comes to dwell on the inside of the believer. In other words, that makes the anointing resident on the inside of you. And so now, not, not only do you have Jesus, but you have the anointed one on the inside of you that gives you power. The Bible talks about the spirit of might. The spirit of might, the spirit of might. When Jesus comes in, the spirit of might comes on the inside of you, and you have the anointed one on the inside of you. Can the church say amen? 
Now the Bible says that if we don't have the spirit of Christ, we are none of here. So if you're born again, the spirit of the Lord has to be on the inside of you. Means the anointing is resident on the inside of you. It's not just itinerant power, but it's resident power. Resident power on the inside of every believer. So you got to know what you got on the inside of you. And one thing the enemy wants to do, he wants to keep us blinded. He wants to keep us in confusion. He wants to keep us ignorant of the fact that you have power already on the inside of you. And so we've been talking about how to cultivate our lives to allow this anointing to flow. Can the church say amen? Because how many know that the Holy Spirit, he comes in, he seals you. He sealed you so we have some measure of the spirit on the inside of us. We know that we experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost where the Holy Ghost not only is only on the inside of you, but the Holy Spirit gets more of your life. He gets more into your business. And so you have to be anointed to have the anointing flowing in your life. Right. So the anointing comes in and it's in your life, but you got to cultivate your life for the anointing to flow. How many want the anointing to flow? And that's what we're talking about in the year 2023. We want the anointing to flow. Tell your neighbor, I want it to flow. I want it to flow. Now, the thing that we got to understand is that you have been filled with the spirit. Those of us who have the Holy Spirit, who are saved, we have the Holy Spirit. Those of us who've been baptized, we've been filled with the spirit. But because you've been filled with the spirit, it does not mean that you're always full of the spirit. So we've been filled with the spirit, but we're not always full of the spirit. And so that is not contingent upon God. That's a contingent upon you because God fills you with the spirit. But if you operate in the flesh, you're not always full of the spirit. Can the church say amen? That means that there's some things that we have to do in order for the anointing to rest upon our lives and for it to flow. Now, these jokes that are existing is probably in our lives in many cases, in many cases, because the anointing of God is not flowing in our lives like it should. Can the church say amen? What does the anointing come to do? It comes to destroy the yoke. Why are we not operate in the in the realm of our ministry to the level that we should? Because maybe the anointing not flow because the anointing is equipping you for ministry. Tell your neighbor, I want the anointing to flow. So we got to we got to cultivate our lives for the anointing. To flow in our lives. Now, this is what I want to share with you from first John, the second chapter, verse number 19. It says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And so I'm just getting right to it. Verse 27 said, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. Where is it? Where does it abide? Because somebody said, well, Pastor, I don't know where, where, what you're saying. Where is it in scripture? I'm showing it to you. But you have the unction from the Holy One and you know all things. But the anointing, verse 27, which you have received of him abided in you. So what I'm saying is that you have to be have the anointing or the anointed one on the inside of you, which makes you anointed. But you got to be anointed in order for the anointing to flow in your life. Just like you got to be saved in order for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now you receive the spirit, but in order for you to receive all that the spirit has in your life, you got to re- you got to be saved. But just because you have been baptized with the Holy Ghost, you've spoken in tongues, it does not mean that you're always full of the spirit. Okay. So when we talk about cultivating our lives for the anointing, The first thing that we said that we need to understand is that the fear of the Lord is at the base or the root of the anointing. The fear of the Lord. Somebody say the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord Lord is at the base or at the root according to Isaiah the 11th chapter. It talks about the spirit of the Lord. It talks about the seven spirit. At the base, at the last one that it lists, it speaks of the fear of the Lord. And then in verse number three in Isaiah 11, it says, and he delights in the fear of the Lord. 
when we, when we understand that, we understand that the reason why the anointing flows in some people's lives and some people it does not flow is because some don't have the fear of the Lord. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? It is reverence for God. It is a holy reverential fear or awe or consideration of who he is. You know, God is transcendent. But oftentimes, a lot of believers deal with God in his transcendence, but not dealing with God through his eminence. What do I mean? His transcendence is that God, he's the God that created everything. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. He put them in the sky and he told them to shine. He allows the water to come but so far, then he tells the water to go back. He's the God that created the hills and the mountains, all the species of birds and fish and everything in the earth. The Bible says he created it all. And so we deal with God because we deal with God in that way in his transcendence. And so we see God as this great big God that's off in the vast distance that we can't relate to. We see him as this great God, El Gabor, Elohim, El Shaddai, all of those names. But the problem with that is that God is too distant. He's too far from us. He's a historical God. He's a historical God. That's why when Jesus came, Jesus taught us to deal with God in terms of relationship. He says, when you pray, he says, pray our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Before Jesus came, they always dealt with him as God, but they never dealt with him as father. And so when Jesus comes, he brings them into a relationship. And then the Bible starts now, 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 now forming this family of God when God already had a family, but God put it in terms so the people could understand that there was heirs and that we were joint heirs, that we were in a family with God and that we were all adopted. So he started using language of the family. And what he's dealing with is he's dealing with the people's mindset because God is not just way over there, but God is right here. His eminence is his right nowness. His eminence is that he's perceivable. His eminence is that he's knowable. His eminence is that he's graspable. He's perceivable. He's knowable. He's graspable. And so his eminence bring God right here in your living room, right here in the church, right here, right beside you. His El Roy, he's the God that sees. He knows our thoughts are far off. He knows your down sitting from your uprising. God knows your name, your social security number. He knows your date of birth, your mother's maiden name. God knows your credit score. God knows all your business because God is imminent in our lives. And that's what he wants us to know, that he's imminent. When we understand he's imminent, it changes how we relate to God. It changes how we relate one to another. Well, this thing got me moving so fast. It changes how we relate to God. And what happens is, is that the a holy reverential fear of the Lord comes into play. Because he's not over there hiding. God is right here. When you say what you're going to say, God is right there. Listening to you. And it brings a fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible said the angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. Heaven is close. Heaven is around you. When you fear the Lord. So God wants us to understand that we need to have a holy reverential fear. And when that happens in our lives, what takes place is that the holy fear of the Lord, it impacts our ways. 
It impacts what we say, what we do. And then it allows the character of Christ to be present in your life. The Holy Ghost rests upon the character of Christ in your life. And when he rests upon the character in your life, meaning you can be trusted with the anointing. You can be trusted with the spirit of God. Because why? I consider my ways because I have a fear of the Lord. It's not just because I'm grace and I'm gifted. But now I have cultivated my life through the fear of the Lord for the Holy Ghost to rest on me. Ten. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Happy New Year.